Great pleasure to welcome uh, Ali Grennan, who I've known for, for many years, Ali, is it so fair to say? And Professor Christoph Lindner to, to Dublin. I'll just read a little bit from their bios. So Professor Christoph Lindner is Professor of Urban Studies and Dean of the Bartlett Faculty of the Built Environment at University College London, where he writes about cities, globalisation and social spatial inequity. So, uh, and Ali, Ali Grehan, Dublin City Architect. Ali Grehan leads a multidisciplinary team responsible for developing a broad. I don't, I'm not going to read this because I know you so well. Why am I reading this one? So <laughs> Ali has been involved in in the in many projects to do with bringing Dublin forward and changes in the city. I suppose you're probably going to talk about Pivot Dublin and various other bits of bobs. Not today. Not today, Ali. Is <laughs> Unless you asked me about I'm, it. I'm obviously very well prepared. Um, so, I, <laughs> so Ali, I can ask, is uh, probably lives closer to the campus than anybody else here. So uh, it's very familiar both with the area and, and with the city. So I think, Ali, you're going to speak first and then Christoph, yep. and then we're going to have some, some chatting and talking in bits and pieces. So. Hi, good morning and thanks for you're all very good to come out <laughs> on a Saturday morning. <laughs> the, um, anyway, so um, when myself and Christoph were chatting about our conversation this morning and I'm just saying, well, what are we going to focus on? Um, we agreed on a title for our conversation, which is what shapes public space, because we're both very interested in issues such as governance and uh, values. And I suppose the, the point is that um, for me, uh, the over overriding uh, determining factor uh, uh, factors in 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 creating good, healthy uh, public space is actually the first, uh, First, uh, they're both equal, governance, which is the systems and um, and structures that are put in place to to uh, to actually deliver something and uh, and how those systems and structures are held to account. And then equally important, maybe more important, actually, uh, are our values our collective values and our priorities and our beliefs around does you know does public space matter now we say it does but do we actually for example prioritize public space over private space i don't know every country would be different every city will be different every neighborhood might be different in terms of how it it values public space and does it really want to uh, focus on on healthy collective space rather than just everybody retreating into their corners so I just uh, said I would uh, to Christoph that I just give a <laughs> very brief uh, kind of overview of maybe what happens in Dublin City Council. And this very, very busy slide is um, I'm not going to go through every item, but um, uh, 2008 is when I became city architect. Um, now, the uh, and there was an awful lot happening before I became city architect, obviously, and uh, in terms of public realm, public realm strategies, how do we approach the P Dublin's public, public realm? Um, but around 2008, just I suppose because I was new into the uh, the organisation, uh, you do pick up on a, on a conversation and it's oh, maybe we need a public realm strategy. And uh, and various groups got together. It was quite a long, uh, quite, uh, it was quite torturous. Um, various groups, department sections got together to try and devise a public realm strategy. Um, we split into just very quickly, we split into four groups. One group was to look at critiquing, one was to look at vision, one was to look at design and one was to look at maintenance. I think I was I from memory, I was in the I was in the design group and the other groups thought that would mean I would come up with sort of paving details. And of course, <laughs> I didn't want to come up with pay, paving details. No, we wanted to get to the bottom of why our public realm is the way it is. So we kind of became the critiquing group. The critiquing group was also the critiquing group, et cetera, et cetera. The, um, so we, we, we kind of uh, tumbled all over each other. Um, eventually, a, a strategy was, was produced. It was circulated externally and it was very, there was very interesting reaction the, the kind of comments that were made are the comments that are made today. They're the same comments. Uh, Dublin City Council needs to be more proactive. We need better maintenance and management structures. 
uh, traffic and parking. What about traffic and parking? Um, some exemplar spaces, you know, spaces, public spaces that we see as, you know, these are, you know, beautiful, award winning public spaces. Well, people are pointing out, well, they don't actually work for everybody. Um, they um, are very interesting, which is why I, I highlighted it or put it in bold. These are just some of the comments was um, this public realm strategy is too bloody generic. It's just the usual peddling, the usual stuff. You could it could it could be from any it could be about any city. Dublin has particular issues. And that's actually probably one of our biggest blind spots is thinking that you can uh, take uh, import a strategy from another city and say, oh, that'll work in Dublin because it, it won't work in Dublin. Um, integrate with other strategies. And then, you know, what about citizens? Where do they fit in? Why is it always Dublin City Council's responsibility? And then ultimately, where's the vision? Well, what vision underpins this strategy? So this went on. We, we, we published a public realm strategy in 2012. Um, various working groups and you know um, overseeing groups. Uh, you know, they the names varied from steering groups to strategic groups to whatever. It didn't matter. There were various groups put in, continue to to tumble along, and try and monitor this strategy. And as as the thing progressed, for example, in June 2016, there was the city centre master plan was was published. So it was starting to um, become not just a very, not a high level strategy, but it was trying to group together and bring in under this public realm strategy as an umbrella, you know, the various projects. Projects that all are happen all the time and they've always been happening, but are they part of an overall program or are, do they, are they all distinct? Um, College Green planning application was made in May 2017. The only reason I picked that one out uh, was because it's such a high profile project. And it's it's it that that's it. It's the centre of the city. It's the heart of the city. I just threw in this. Um, I can talk about Pivot Dublin later if you like, Barry. Okay. <laughs> you can ask me about the framework project. Framework. I just again as an example. Um, uh, framework was a a, a design initiative uh, collaboration with a, a business group. Uh, they came to us. The bid. Uh, um, Business Improvement District. Um, they came to us to say they'd like to do a, a, a design uh, process uh, with us. Um, we did actually advertise this as an opportunity. They would like us to help them figure out why the North uh, Retail Quarter had not recovered as quickly from the crash as the South Retail Quarter. And they themselves had identified it was because of the poor quality public realm, the lack of uh, connectivity between the various streets in the city that the people had a, had had, mental, had gaps in their mental map of the north inner city which, which made them kind of think that for example henry street is miles away from capel street whereas the south uh, the grafton street quarter is better connected people have a more of a sense that it is a a, a general it is an area there are lots of streets feeding off it so that was interesting um uh, up to now, we've got um, public realm has uh, has really become as a focus in the in the city council. It's very it's 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 a very big thing, and in fact, it's so big that people are different departments are constantly competing with each other as to who is in charge, because that's um, and uh, we've actually got a lot of urban re urban regeneration development funding for public realm projects. There was the government uh, uh, launched this. Um, package of uh, funding for projects that would revitalize urban areas and we Dublin City Council applied for a lot of um, a lot of stuff and most of them were actually public ground projects and we've got the active travel projects as well as in par as part of that there you know the active travel projects which is all about cycling comes to 170 million is, is in the program look this is an example. This is a, a map of uh, of the city centre master plan, the public ground project. You can see College Green is 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 right in the heart of the of the public realm um, strategy project program. OK, when you kind of come to governance and values, I, I mean, it's still a bit of a mess <laughs> in the sense that is this a, are, are, is it a well-oiled machine? Is there some higher God, you know, determining how we develop public spaces in Dublin? 
Well, you've got all of the DCC departments are still involved, including the housing department and, and actually trying to trying to say to the housing department that actually they are very important when it comes to public space is, is actually culturally kind of challenging thing to say because the housing department wants to just concern itself with its housing projects and and and, and the public realm is something that happens outside the railing um, but in fact obviously anything that the housing department is doing impacts which you've got parks whatever you've got uh, planning and development very important Environment and transport is still the, I suppose, dominant uh, department for public realm activity. But then you come to all the other agencies and groups and whatever, like Transport Infrastructure Ireland, the NTA, de delivering transport projects. That's impactful on the public realm. You've got so all of these disparate groups all have to be brought together to actually ensure that a project works effectively that it delivers what it promises um the easiest if you've got the money and you've got a good design team the easiest thing in the world is to build a beautiful public space <laughs> that's just the beginning and uh and and then there's a question of whether you have the money i mean bus connects just to mention the uh nta bus connects is this major transport a uh, public transport project happening in dublin it's going to completely transform how the the bus uh, the bus system operates. Well, the NTA would ob obviously consider it it's a public transport project. It's about people on buses and getting them from A to B. It's actually we would say it's the biggest, it's the most significant public round project happening in Dublin. So it's how do you see something, and what are your values? And um, just quickly about College Green, because it was so um, uh, just as, as an example, uh, we went in for um, uh, made a planning application to onboard Planola uh, to develop or transform College Green. The space exists. It, it's really just to change how we use it and, and, and value it. Um, we, we went in for planning in 2017 and we were refused planning <laughs> in 2018. We were quite surprised because we we really thought it was a no brainer. And um, the this this photograph is of the, the guy taking the photograph here is uh, the chief architect in of the Bay Area Rapid Transit system. And I just happened. I just met him at a conference uh, up in Dublin Castle. He was uh, speaking and um, it was just after the the. We'd, we'd been refused permission for College Green and I was just talking to him about it. And he was very interested in in our public transport because obviously that's his area of, of expertise. He was interested in these very big public um, transport projects happening in Dublin. So I took him down to College Green to say, well, you know, the reason fundamentally, the reason we refused permission was because of how it would impact traffic, particularly the bus service, because we were talking about making taking out all the traffic, including bus buses. From from College Green, and uh, Chance was kind of very. He he just said he couldn't believe this. He because this photograph doesn't do it justice. There was just a wall of empty buses, and we're talking about it's half nine in the morning, so it's past uh, rush hour. It's just this wall of empty buses uh, clogging up College Green, and you've got the Lewis trying to make its way around, and you've got people trying to to walk across and and uh, across the road and and it's just a mess and he said um, I've been to many cities in the world but I've never seen anything like this not even in Istanbul so um, we are going again at College Green and uh, we are uh, these were some drawings that were just uh, cartoons that were uh, prepared for just a, a kind of a, a consultation and engagement exercise where we just actually asked people did they want to see did they want College Green pedestrianised? Uh, did they want it extended to uh, Dame Street East? So we've actually uh, extended the area from College Green, the immediate area of College Green. Uh, we wanted to know what about extending it further down Dame Street and would people like that Dame Street section fully pedestrianised or would they like it partially pedestrianised? So that's what we're working on at the moment. We're looking at an option that um, that actually extends College Green uh, West 
and uh, sorry, the pedestrian area and actually does works to adjoining streets. But uh, it's quite. Uh, it's challenging. The issues haven't gone away except for one issue, which has been which I suppose just really does encapsulate why why things take so long is because now bus, bus connects uh, have uh, decide, have uh, announced when when it was launched a couple of years ago year or so ago it uh, it did um, it did say that it would not need to send buses through College Green so we go back to the drawing board <laughs> thank you so hi everybody good to see people in the room and also wonderful to know that there are people joining us online. And uh, thank you, Ali, for sharing some thoughts about real places and, and real projects. And I really appreciate that because I want to talk in slightly more abstract terms about what post-pandemic public space might be and how it might work and who might get to shape it. And the reason that I want to talk in more abstract terms is because my background, I'm not an architect, I'm an urban theorist. So I think a lot about cities and I try to understand them. And the thoughts that I want to share with you today are, I would describe them as tentative reflections. These are not authoritative comments or any kind of you know, set of piercing knowledgeable insights. I think I'm grappling with a lot of what I hope are the same things that you're also thinking about and experiencing when it comes to public spaces in our cities. So before the pandemic, um, a lot of the work that I was doing was thinking about slowness in cities. What does it mean to be slow? How can we be slow? When is slow a privileged condition or experience? And when is slow uh, something um, radical with the potential to disrupt and push back against the accelerating atomizing forces of neoliberal urbanism. And so I spent a lot of time working with colleagues in lots of places around the world, thinking about concepts and conditions such as immobility, stillness, inertia, deceleration, interruption, those kinds of words. And then the pandemic happened. And suddenly, all of these words and all of the experiences they connect to in cities acquired new and different meanings. So to be slow during the pandemic, I think, meant something very different than being slow in a city before the pandemic. Now slowness was an enforced condition. Immobil immobility was imposed upon millions, if not billions of people around the world. And we all had to try and figure out what that meant. And the way that it kind of reprogrammed, recalibrated our relationship with home, with neighborhood, with city, with space in general. So there are two images that I want to just share with you today, because I think each of them evokes in different ways, key dynamics that were happening out in streets during the pandemic. And I don't know about you, but one of the things I found really difficult as an urbanist to do during the pandemic, because we could not travel, is to actually understand if what we were experiencing in our own hyper-local environments, some of us you know, not able to leave our homes or go more than, say, I don't know, a kilometer from our homes is what was happening in London, where I lived. The same thing is happening in Dublin or Amsterdam or Sao Paulo or Johannesburg or Hong Kong. And of course, we know it wasn't all identical. So being able to engage in kind of comparative analysis, comparative study uh, was really, really difficult. And I think we're only now that travel is coming back able to really begin doing that work. So this first image is um, from Soho in central London from spring 2020. So at a time when much of the world was deep in its first lockdowns. And this is a time when all restaurants and shops were closed, 
when normally very busy streets were completely deserted, when businesses were boarding over. It was a time when a city like London looked as if it had suddenly, inexplicably gone bankrupt overnight. Everything shut and the boards up on the restaurants. So this is a moment when public space was largely closed to the public. And I think that was an experience that we shouldn't minimize or underestimate the impact on civic life, on everyday experience of urban residents and citizens. What does it mean when the only open spaces available for the public and for civic discourse to come together in a city are unavailable to you and closed off from you? But the streets were not fully empty. And there was this new kind of what I like to call vicarious mobility happening. So lots of people, particularly privileged residents, were able to stay home, work from home, shop online from home, order food from home. And this image of the delivery driver zipping past the closed storefront of a normally uh, busy restaurant, looking at his phone, and I imagine, you know, maybe looking at where he has to go and drop off the food. To me, this image is incredibly resonant because we were outsourcing our mobility to precarious um, um, precarious workers all across the city who were delivering our food, delivering our, I don't know, you know, all the books, delivering uh, furniture, delivering Wi-Fi units, you know, all the stuff that we needed to function. So it was never true that cities fully shut down, I think in most cases, but rather this kind of ghost mobility, this vicarious mobility, most of which we never saw was happening all across the city. And for me, what this image reveals is not something new and different. It brings into very sharp focus something that has always been true, especially in the 21st century, of urban space, including public space, which is that at its core, it unfortunately, quite tragically, has operated around inequality and precarity. And so much work, such as what Ali has been talking about, is about responding to that, addressing that, overcoming that. And the pandemic showed us how enduring those conditions continue to be in cities, inequality and precarity. And that connects to my second image. This is also from the spring of 2020. It comes from a different city. This is an image of Domino Park in Brooklyn. And it shows um, uh, something that, that, that parks in lots of cities around the world tried, which is organized social distancing. So these sort of social distancing bubbles in public space that allow people to come together yet stay apart. And for me, that weird condition of being together yet apart that we've all experienced during social distancing in the pandemic, it's deeply uncomfortable. You might argue it's actually highly problematic, but again, I don't think it's anything new. It's just making visible in a way we didn't have available before, the ways in which even in public space when we come together, we may not be together in forms that truly matter, that there's still distance between us. Further, I think it's fascinating, but also problematic, the extent to which these kinds of images circulated globally and the public fascination, and I'm part of that, um, that lots of us had for these images of trying to to, to limp back into public space and find ways to reoccupy our cities while staying safe 
and staying healthy. And to me, there's a high degree of aestheticization going on here, right? So the way that this photo is taken, what it shows you, the way it's framed, the kind of self-composition of the image by the families and the groups occupying their, their, their circles and respecting it. To me, this might be at a, at a, at a kind of innocent level, um, an image of people hanging out, getting some air, maybe socializing a bit under pandemic conditions. But it's also to me an image of coer a, a kind of a coercive public space. You know, there are things you can do and not do. There are places you're allowed to be and not be in this image. And there's a distance that must be maintained between people. The pandemic brought this sort of stuff to the fore. But I, again, I don't think it was new. I think so much of contemporary public space is controlled, is about surveillance, mm -hmm. is about discipline over human bodies in public space. And the other part of the pandemic, which many of us experienced, and this image evokes it, is the unequal access to green space in our cities. And we've known for a very long time that that's a problem. And we've known for a very long time that the urban poor have far less access to green space. But it became almost a, a matter of urgent public health during the pandemic. And this weird moment, I don't know if you had it in Dublin, we certainly had it in London, where parks were essential but policed and people were getting arrested for, you know, sitting on benches together and, and, and being fined for running, no, walking, but not running. So like disguising themselves as if they were jogging, but in reality, they were just walking together and chatting and this constitute a violation of regulations. But also who got access to those spaces and under what conditions? And who had access to private green space, whether in the form of a backyard, or rooftop balcony. So putting all this together, um, you know, what is the point I'm making? I don't know if you would agree, but to me, it feels like more and more we live in an era of pseudo public space. Public space that has the appearance, but not the substance of publicness. And I think the pandemic opened up a moment when we might have radically challenged that and radically changed it. But that window is now closing. So mostly I feel very pessimistic. Mostly I feel like we're going to continue to have public spaces that aren't truly free and open. But what we're also hearing at this conference, and this is the part that makes me optimistic, and this a lot of this happened during the pandemic, new local community-based neighborhood kind of scale um, interventions, coalitions, activism to kind of reclaim public space at a really intimate local level and turn it into something that does benefit community, that does promote justice and health and sustainability. So I don't know how we do it. And this is something we need to be talking about together. But it feels like the kinds of projects that we've heard about over the course of this conference, there've been many examples, these need to be nourished, amplified, accelerated, they need to be given space and money and resources and, 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 and backing, in particular by urban governments, and allowed to flourish and develop and see how far they can go. And meanwhile, as the public, but also in city government, I think we need to be open to the disruptions that they bring, be willing to not just to be challenged, but to be changed by them. So I'm a firm believer in bottom-up bottom -up urbanism. But I also recognize the really important role and the enabling role that kind of top-down urbanism in the city government can bring. 
And so we, it feels like we're in a moment now where these two things need to come together. The bottom up leads the top down and the top down leads the bottom up. So where are the fora? Where are the, the, those moments and spaces where we can get these, the, the, these two groups of people who are all interested in better, healthier, more beautiful, more open public space? How do we get them together? And how do we make the most of this moment we've got where momentum has built and there have been lots of creative community interventions that are not accepting a kind of unequal public space that we had pre-pandemic. So let me stop there. Thank you. Okay, so, so I'm sorry to anybody who's online who, who uh, wants to ask a question. We can. Is there any questions for either Ali or Christoph? All right. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that. Specifically to do with Temple Bar, uh, mm. not just that journey, but that the square there has its own journey with all of the um, restaurants who have seen to have kind of taken that over. Can you tell us if it's there any plans, I suppose, for them to be able to take that, reclaim that space? That was a COVID measure, is it not? Was the Temple Bar Square a COVID measure or was it not there already? The, the, I think it. I think, well, I mean, no, you, you're asking, you know, that's a good question. I mean, in the sense that um, Capel Street is, is mm. say, for example, is, is, a, is a fresher example of this, that um, the, I remember walking down Capel Street during the, you know, COVID closures, and it was, uh, it was it's, it's the first time I felt afraid, you know, mm. and this would be in broad daylight, mm. because you realise that, um, uh, so I'd be going into work because I, I I was entitled to to uh, to go into work, uh, go into the office, and um, and I can walk in and and um, and it's the first time I felt afraid in in uh, and I you know and and this was in broad daylight and it was because it occurred to me that there was nobody around and uh, and I could meet somebody somebody could be coming in the opposite direction. And if they decided to hit me over the head, there was nobody around to stop them. So, and now Capel Street, then you looked at the, the, the what happened um, when things started opening up and, and suddenly in Ireland, we discovered outdoor dining. We hadn't really done that before. <laughs> and we actually just, I, I mean, I have to say, I discovered outdoor dining in our backyard. <laughs> we all discovered outdoor dining. And, um, and now it's become, uh, now, is it good or bad? I don't know. C Cable Street is, is kind of announced as what, last week or the week before one of the 20, 22nd most coolest street in the world or something. A lot of the street has been taken over and appropriated by, well, it's been, it's been pedestrianised. Uh, and um, but a lot of the footpaths, it's had to be pedestrianised because the footpaths are pretty much taken over by businesses. Now, why are you asking me the question about Temple Bar? Because I think, see, I think that from memory, the Temple Bar Square was already, pre-COVID, was already pretty much taken over by um, uh, restaurants. Yes, there is a plan to to refurbish the square. I'm not, it's, it's not being dealt with through city architects, so I'm not sure exactly where, where it's at. But it does go to Christoph's point about um, privatization of public space, mm -hmm. because and and why does it happen? Well, it's 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 as it's why it always happens. It's whoever's bigger, stronger, uh, has more economic clout, and um, and uh, the reason so much of public space has been taken into restaurants is because otherwise, or bars, is because the the question was if 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 it didn't happen, they would fail. They would shut down. They wouldn't be able to do business. So um, the that is you're asking me: Is Dublin City Council going to take back the streets and 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 take it back from the restaurants and bars? Well, I'll just ask you: Do you do you think that's a good idea or a bad idea? And I I just I'm curious to know. It's a good idea. I think okay. I remember the square. It was where booksellers would would occupy and. Um, you know when you go through like, yes yes I do know. There'd be book sellers, there'd be people selling like lots of different things, and now it's just like 
the High Rock Cafe and like all the no. Irish clubs. And ah, so it's 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 um, and I'm I'm actually not being. I, no, no, I think you're, you're you're kind of you're being you're making interesting points. But so you're okay with it being appropriated by the things you would like <laughs> uh, to you like, but not. <laughs> Interesting, but I think it, it's, an, it, it's more to do with um, you know those sellers would come on like a Saturday or a Sunday, and it was a place where teenagers would congregate, and you didn't have to spend money to be there. You didn't have to, whereas now you have to spend money to sit there. I, I absolutely agree with you. It is wrong for public space to be taken over for for you for you to have to have money and and not not just have it, spend it in order to be there. I agree with you. But uh, and I do I do uh, agree with you that um, if there is going to be transactions happening in public space where people are selling stuff to other people, yeah, I agree with you. It does it does make sense that the 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 ones that are the the businesses are that are at the more fragile end uh, should be entitled and almost should be encouraged to get. Public public spaces are. We could look at them. Maybe we should be looking at them as a way of 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 uh, seed capital. It's a it's a it's allowing a business to establish because it is public space. Yeah. No. No. That's a really really good point. Oh, I want to know one something. Um, the kind of square function part. Ah. <laughs> 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 Ali, would you want to explain to the Christoph's asking what is what is there? Maybe there's others that we don't know. Yeah. Okay, and 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 can I say I too hate the word quarter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just fed up with everything being quarter these days. Quarter or what? Um the um yeah, Parnell Square is a uh is a very important Georgian Square, not too far from here. Um it's it's very beautiful. It's unusual in that uh in uh, Unlike other Georgian squares, the actual square itself, the garden, uh, what had been pleasure gardens, has been taken over by a hospital. So it's yeah. actually there's very little of the the central park uh, enclosed area that is actually public. It's it's a hospital, and then there's a small park at the yeah. at the top, um, and then across the way we've uh, we've got various institutions around Parnell Square, and it has become. Um, uh, it is the proposed site on the north side of the city library, new city library. So it's a, it's an excellent site for the city library. But okay, in terms of the actual public realm across the north of the square, that's in that's that's covered under that's been progressed as will be progressed as a project, and it's uh, as and it has URDF funding. So that's what's happening. What's happening with the buildings and the library, which is really important in order to actually really act as a catalyst for, for the square. Yes, that's being dealt with by um, the uh, city librarian, that project. No, no, I don't have any idea. OK, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to ask questions. Thank you for really interesting presentations. Um, I guess I'm interested in the politics of the public space, and you know this this idea of shaping the public space. It's not an expression that people like to use very much. But environmental determinism and the effects on, on society. I suppose I'm not phrasing this particularly well. But I wonder what you thought about the limits of shaping the space. How you engage in these issues to do with inequality that you've talked about, Crystal, or the other kind of the realities in Dublin of homelessness or drug users or you know how how do you how do you engage with those subjects or is it impossible so um I can offer a few thoughts and the first one would be for me at least I I, I really see public space as a site of power contestation, mm -hmm. right? So this, you know, public space, it can be playful, it can be fun, it can be happy, but it's always a place where different politics and through that different forms and expressions of power are, are, um, uh, are, are active. And um, 
And there's an interesting question in your question, which is, you know, the idea of agency, you know, so what shapes public space? And it sort of assumes that public space is there to be shaped. And, you know, maybe city government does, maybe citizen groups, uh, maybe residents, maybe local business owners. But there's another way of thinking about it, particularly through an environmental lens, which is what if, what if public space is not there to be shaped, um, uh, but the shape is there to shape us, or the space is there to shape us. So if you think about, um, and it's it's not the best term, but like the rewilding movement, you know, mm. letting nature back in, letting a bit, let it, letting it be a bit more uncontrolled, and letting it do its thing without as much intervention and control and manicure from the part of human society. What then happens to biodiversity and green space in cities? And what places might it flourish that aren't just the pre-decided, this is a park, this can be green, that's a car park, that must be paved over. You know, it's suddenly, you know, green spaces and biodiversity can blossom in walls and cracks in, in places where it doesn't traditionally belong. So, you know, it's easy to say as a theorist, but personally, I feel very open to a future of thinking about the emergence of, you know, common spaces, if you want to think of that phrase for, for, for public space, a future of common spaces um, that makes a lot more room for the unplanned, um, for the kind of, you know, bio natural um, and for less human intervention. And um, we might be pleasantly surprised about what becomes possible. Just yesterday, we had a series of presentations about the alleys in, in Belfast and um, both the adopted and unadopted alleys. And, and I was just fascinated. I thought it was really important looking at the greenness of those places and the different ways in which um, that, that greenness um, manifested itself through kind of carefully curated and presented versions to totally kind of just unkempt and, and, and really very wild. Um, but where, whatever it is on that spectrum, um, it seems to me that the, the, the presence of that greenness um, was a very powerful presence in the city. And so rethinking the relationship between the human and the non-human and the biodiverse is a priority, I, I believe, going forward. Hmm. I mean, but public space has always been seen as a resource. The question is a resource for what and for whom? In, I mean, in Ireland, certainly we do struggle with them. Um, it's, it's seen as a resource for getting to HB in a big car. That's the, the, that's the usefulness of it. Um, whereas, as, um, as Christoph so eloquently described, the, during lockdown, we really we, we came to uh, value it in a different way. Suddenly, it was every 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 square inch within the whatever the limit the limited zone of, of movement <clears throat> was. I mean, whether it was two kilometers or five kilometers, it suddenly became really it it we well to people. Sorry, I've always seen it as important what's happening on the footpath outside my front door because I walk everywhere, so I know how important it is. How how that experience of getting from A to B, if you're walking, how it can make your day or blight your day. I mean, you have an unpleasant experience walking, and um, and it really and and I mean, it, it, it's frustrating. But I'm, I think sl there are many there are many people like me, but we are in a minority. Most people don't even see it, but everybody had to see it during COVID. Everybody had to see it, and uh, and then it became a, 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 it was crystal clear some streets, not all streets are equal. Um, even though we're all equal, not all streets are equal. And uh, and some people had um, um, exquisite experiences on their daily two kilometer walks and other people didn't. Uh, the, uh, the, and, and those people who were actually most uh, disadvantaged in terms of their private space happened to also be most disadvantaged. In terms of public space, because yeah, it's sort of it's it's, it's self evident. But public space has always been a resource, and uh, the question now is post COVID climate catastrophe era that we're in. Um, what sort of resource will public space be? And it sounds daft, but but it is it is shared space, and yes, it should be cultivated. 
you know, if we can take it back from, if we can stop seeing it as just a, a way, a resource for people in cars to get from A to B. Uh, and I know there are there are lots of legitimate reasons for getting into a car, and that's I'm not I'm not I'm I'm not being I'm not blind to that. Obviously, I we have a car, we use it. Um, the um, uh, but uh, that it's it's almost um. That that's the hierarchy of need, you know, is 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 the private car user, and the bigger the bigger the car, the greater the need, um, and the entitlement. The if we can start looking at public space as a resource, and we will have to. In so, cities, we're going to have to look of look at it as something that has to be softer, permeable to to to, to help adapt to, uh, rainfall flooding. It's good. It's it's and 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 that is actually the antithesis of, of the kind of spaces you make if you're just providing for, say, vehicle use. So not, it doesn't just have to be sought. You're right. There's a bio, biodiversity crisis. Stop, it's not just a, it's a climate crisis, biodiversity crisis. Our public spaces and our streets and our network of our network has to, uh, we have to make it hospitable to, to creatures and uh, and uh, including ourselves, and uh, and and we need to be able to grow stuff. We, we need to start looking at it as places where we can grow stuff. Um, so I suppose the question is like, how do we design? So I don't know why this is not a helpful response, but it made me think of the article I was reading about how urban honey is some of the tastiest honey because the bees get the greatest diversity of different kinds of pollen. And so it creates a very vibrant kind of diverse honey. And I think that's a nice metaphor for how diversity in the city in all forms hmm. is, is, is really um, beneficial. I, th I, I think you're right in, in identifying that at the moment, when we think about our society's relationship with urban nature it is one where where um uh, urban nature um like you say is tolerated it's invited it's invited in it's curated it's it's controlled and i'm always fascinated by post-apocalyptic urban cinema and its visions of the post-apocalyptic city and so how do you communicate the post-apocalypse cinematographically and it's usually by showing nature has run, you know, um, like in like in The Walking Dead or, or or things like that. It's about trees growing where they shouldn't. It's about nature encroaching on 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 kind of human civilization and and, and controlled and planned urban space. Um, so um, you know, if we really are going to embrace the full beneficial potential of inviting uh, the natural world back into our cities. I think over time we need to shift that attitude that you've identified to being one much more about coexistence um, and, and less about, you know, a, a kind of hierarchical relationship. And I'm not sure how we achieve that. So maybe you have ideas or others in the audience do. Hmm. Sorry. So, sorry. So, sorry. So government's question. How would you go about increasing bottom-up urbanism amongst the populace? Because from my own experience, usually the people that show up to these committee meetings are a very vocal minority, usually from business leaders and business in the US. How would you go about giving more access to everyone to participate in the sort of bottom-up urbanism? So it isn't only coming from a vocal minority in business groups or from a top-down approach. Maybe you haven't done much research in that, but here's some kind of go to. I have a few thoughts, but I imagine you have a lifetime of experience. Um, well, it's all about permission. 
giving people permission. I mean, say Granby Park was a good example of bottom up urbanism where we're for a group. A group came wanted to. Uh, this was just after the crash. Well, the crash. We had the crash, and everybody was looking for desperately running around looking for solutions. <clears throat> and it was creative people who had the solutions. Um, the and then we have post COVID, and then Granby Park was there was a group who I'm sure many of you, some of you are nodding, so you know you know Granby Park. But they were trying to put a um, to create this park, temporary park. But it was going to they were going to invest a lot of time and energy into it, so it couldn't be like temporary for a week. It had to be over an extended period of time. And um, they their initial their preferred site, they couldn't they couldn't do it because they the site owner property owner wouldn't couldn't allow wouldn't allow them. So you, you that's it. You know that's what. What it's about, it's about property owner, owners of property being nervous about ceding control to another group because will I ever get my property back sort of thing and um, for other other um, reasons. And um, and so it actually was. We stepped in uh, to say, well, OK, we have a vac we have a vacant site, it, it's it's earmarked for housing. In fact, there's a housing Department, large apartment development now nearly finished on the site, but um, you can use this. So it was all about permission and then a little bit more, you know, a little bit of assistance in terms of professionally kind of smoothing the way for them in terms of insurances, all of these kind of all of these things. You mentioned that lady mentioned bees and people, child being stung by a bee. Haven't children, <laughs> are children always stung by bees? I <laughs> think that's not just a fact of life. Um, but um, but people, we are very, um, uh, um, I suppose, uh, conscious of, of, you know, somebody, it's somebody else's fault and I'm going to claim for something. So smoothing the way over in terms of insurances and, and but permission is the first thing. And I suppose it's frustrating. It is. Look, I've just been I've been part of this conversation for so long now and I'm just hearing the same arguments go round and round and round. On the one hand, the haves recognise the value of bottom up urbanism. Because bottom up urbanism kind of transforms places and it creates, it adds value. And and it's just such a, um, there is, I, I don't know the solution to it because the, the haves welcome the bottom up urbanism because mm -hmm. they see it, it increases the value of their property. But as soon as the, but they don't want, uh, um, but nobody is, uh, very few organizations are willing to actually uh, trust bottom up urbanism so completely that they say, yes, it is yours. It is yours to do whatever you want to do with. And I'm sorry, we have not so we have not the solution to this in Dublin. Um, so I think the word permission that you're using, mm. Ali, is a really powerful, important word in all of this. Um, and there is enormous value and importance to the planning function in city, right? And it can, from a health and safety point of view, an environmental kind of uh, safety point of view, really avert you know horrible crises and problems and disasters and so on. Um, what has struck me about so many of the examples that have come up in this conference about grassroots community-led activism during the pandemic, kind of reclaiming and, and repurposing public space, is how much of that activity occurred without permission. And perhaps one of the things that made all of this creative activity possible was the fact that the, 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 the governance function was not there during the height of lockdown because you know, that, that wasn't a possibility. And so doing things at a local level without permission um, enabled a tremendous amount of creativity. I'm sure some terrible things have also happened because of that, but we've been hearing at this conference about some of the wonderful and beautiful and enriching things that can happen because of that. The challenge now, it seems, is we're in a moment where that um, um, set of uh, interventions that um, were not authorized have to be reconciled with governance. 
And that's where the challenge is, you know, can all of those projects continue while still getting permission and being, you know, lawful and having appropriate insurance coverage? You know, will that kill off the creativity? So one concrete example of, uh, you know, bottom up urbanism that can blossom, but maybe over blossom would be the High Line Elevated Park in New York, a piece of disused urban infrastructure, transport <laughs> infrastructure, which um, began with just a community local group wanting to make it a nice place and thinking about, you know, a new life for it. And that snowballed beyond anyone's I expectation. I don't agree with you about the High Line. I love, I think the High Line is beautiful, but that is not a place where you, anybody can do whatever they want. So let me, let me get to the end, <laughs> let me get to the end of the point. And that's, that's, that's what I argue in, in, in my book on the High Line is what starts off as a very utopian, very yeah. grassroots, very community driven organization mm -hmm. uh, uh, effort has turned in to the most frightening, yeah. excessive, neoliberal urban transformation of a whole section of a city that in the end has Sorry led, interrupted has you, led yeah. both <laughs> symbolically and architecturally towards something I don't mind describing as a monstrosity, which is Hudson Yards, a total non-place uh, um, that, that, that has just you know, decimated any possibility of neighborhood and connection and sense of place. And even the initial community organizers who got the Highline project going have looked back and said, wow, this did not go in the way that we thought. And so whether you call that a success or not is, you know, is up for debate. Depends for whom. It was very yeah. successful for all of the property owners who made so much, whose sites were kind of just catapulted. In, in yeah. so can we just take one last question from Nora because of her under pressure of coffee break and all that. Mm -hmm. So Nora, you Maybe been answered. I'm not quite sure. I was thinking of tactical urbanism. Mm. I'm not asking permission, mm. but and the idea of like trying things as a short term solution for a long term plan. You know, so there is there is a strategy involved in the type of project. Mm. Um, and I, I think over, as you said yourself, over the pandemic, it were local community groups were incredibly creative about how they manage these public spaces. Do we need seriously to document even those that happened without permission, you know, to recognise those legitimately? Well, of course we do. Uh, yeah, yeah, the um, uh, well, for start, I would not. Uh, I mean, any creative group or creative person I've ever come across is is ferociously practical and competent. I mean, they they don't have. There's no issue there in terms of you know you know this. They're more competent and clever than most of the people who are in kind of more of the established side of life. Oh, and, and, uh, but I mean, so they're very capable, tend to be very, very capable people. And so they're not going to create, you know, a hazardous place or anything. They, they know what they're doing. But um, you know, I, I tell you, this has become one of my catchphrases. I'm just completely fed up with pilot projects as um in the sense that I know what they are. They are shorthand for let's look, let, let's keep some people. They're like little sweeteners. Uh, they just, uh, we'll do a pilot project, but we'll know that when the, the, the you know, when we get down to real business, <laughs> we won't be, yeah. that's the end of the pilot project. No, no, but it's- Pilot project, yeah. as recognizing the solutions that were, com that people came up with, maybe illegally, <laughs> but recognizing them as legitimate answers to questions. Yes, I, I mean, but I just I, don't. I, yeah, sure I, no, no, I, I just feel that there's actually not an awful lot new that's been asked. I just know that 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 the powerful forces will all powerful forces will always dictate what happens. And the question is, what are those powerful forces? And we we tend to, like we were one thing about COVID, which was so startling for everybody, was um, how autocrat, you know, how mm. room could be imposed so quickly that you know in a way that completely changed how we were we, we, and, and how compliant we were by and large yeah. actually we were extremely compliant um the um uh but um the powerful force that uh, uh that is going to determine public space we can do it which should and, and probably will determine how public space is used is actually addressing climate change 
that's going to be that's the powerful force that we're going to have to get our heads around. And so, but um, uh, I don't know. I, I suppose maybe I'm, I'm just not. Um, I, I just I just don't ever see a future where the weak will inherit the earth, the meek and the <laughs> weak will inherit the earth. I, I just, uh, uh, it'll just become, uh, some things will happen because they are unavoidable truths. Okay, well, on, on that cheery note. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess I can just thank uh, Ali Brennan and, and Christoph Lindner. And uh, you can chat outside the road, have a coffee break until uh, quarter past 11. <laughs>